Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Wheat fields are sprouting across Oklahoma, giving our state a lovely shade of green. But as OSU Extension entomologist Tom Royer tells us, the first threat to this year's crop is already arriving. This last summer, uh, we started getting early flights of fall armyworm that, uh, that are blown in on weather fronts from the south because it doesn't overwinter in Oklahoma. So it's become established here early. This is probably the third flight that we've seen uh, that has attacked any vulnerable uh, crops such as sorghum, corn, or now wheat. From now until the first frost, Royer suggests farmers should be out in the field scouting for damage. The caterpillar's hatch are really tiny when they get started and their mouth parts aren't even strong enough to chew down a leaf. So what they do is they scrape the leaf tissue off the leaf uh, and uh, cause um, injury that we call window painting. That's the first sign that you have an infestation out in your field and that is the best time to, to try and get control of them. Uh, a lot of times what, what will happen is that producers won't notice the injury until uh, you see areas like you might see out here where there are bare spots out in there where the worms have gotten bigger and are chewing down the wheat. To check for the threat, simply walk through the field. The treatment uh, threshold that we use to determine whether a field needs to be treated is you go out and scout different areas of the field. If we see uh, two to three per square foot, that's a, a treatment threshold that we suggest uh, using an insecticide to control them. There are plenty of different insecticides that are available to control them. They're all pretty effective, especially if you catch the uh, caterpillars when they're small. If you'd like more information on fall armyworms, visit your local county extension office or go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. From wheat to canola now, and a planting update with our extension canola specialist, Josh Bouchong. So well, we're kind of towards the tail end of planting season. Uh, winter canola acres are a little bit less than last year. Uh, not what we were shooting for, but obviously with the conditions and the drought persisting and stuff like that, it's been harder for a lot of farmers. Uh, but uh, Friday was the last planting date for insurance for RMA. Uh, there is a late planting period where they have till the 15th of October, Wednesday. Uh, so if they still need to get in there and plant some canola, uh, they do have that late planting period to work with. They do lose, uh, I believe, 3% of their guarantee per day uh, past that October 10th planting date. Uh, but for the most part, most of our guys got the crop in the ground. A lot of guys are waiting on a little bit of moisture. Bouchong says canola will see a boost in Oklahoma as more counties become insurance eligible. We've gone from 10 program RMA insurance counties to 15 in the state of Oklahoma. It did help get some more guys interested in canola. Uh, in the past, they've had to rely on written agreements to see if they are able to get insurance for canola. Uh, so that does ease a lot of stress on the farmer. Uh, but like I said, a lot of those counties we're still waiting on a rain on, so I would say the rain probably influenced our acres more than anything else, but adding those program counties have definitely uh, helped us out in the long run. It is also important to be out early scouting the crop. If the crop is, uh, say at this stage, where it's one to two true leaves, uh, we still need to get some size on it before winter. Hopefully we'll get some rains. Uh, next week or two to get that crop to the desired size of four to six true leaves and a root diameter about the size of a pencil or greater uh, to really withstand those cold temperatures during the winter. And while they're out scouting and looking at their stands, they need to be looking for worms, uh, both army cut worms and the diamondback moth larva uh, can hinder uh, that growth of the plant or thin out the, the crop. So uh, a lot of times those army cut worms prefer tilled sandy ground they come in from the Rockies, lay their eggs, uh, they'll more or less prune on the roots throughout the fall and winter. So we have to kind of look for symptomology on the leaves and if we start seeing some stressed areas, maybe some red purple plants, uh, start digging around in the ground, see if we can find some of those worms. The diamondback moth larvae are going to be in the leaves. Uh, the small uh, greenish worm uh, has kind of two chronicles on its tail end. Uh, so be out there looking for those worms. 
the seed does come with the seed treatment uh, an insecticide and fungicide but that insecticide seed treatments really only good for aphids uh, which has helped us out a lot um, uh, but it doesn't do much for lepidoptera uh, all of our worms so get out there look for worms look at your stand uh, and see where you stand going into winter for the past month or so producers have been planting wheat for a wheat crop but also to help feed cattle now daryl let's talk about how the wheat looks in the pasture situation you know as of uh, this week's crop report uh, about 70 percent of oklahoma's wheat is planted that's about 20 percentage points above normal uh, about 27 percent of that wheat has already emerged that's a little bit ahead of normal for this time of the year and that sort of speaks to the the real issue right now we need some more moisture most of this wheat uh, needs some uh, another rain at least and, and maybe a couple of rains to really make wheat pasture. But if we get that, we're gonna have a lot of wheat pasture. There's a lot of interest in, uh, in wheat pasture cattle this fall, I think. And so there'll be a lot of demand for wheat pasture, uh, or, or at least there'll be a lot of wheat pasture available. There may be a limited supply of cattle, and, and, and so that's uh, gonna be an issue for some folks. Okay, o over the past couple of weeks or so, months or so, we've seen uh, calf prices going up. Let's talk about what producers should be doing if they have calves. You know, the seasonal pattern, of course, for lightweight calves is to go to a low in the fall, usually in early November. We're not seeing that yet, and I'm not sure we're going to see a lot of that this year. If we get those rains and we get that wheat pasture, almost undoubtedly we'll continue to see very strong prices. We actually have a chance to even go higher given the limited supply of cattle available this year. Even without wheat pasture, or if it's somewhat, uh, you know, average or, or moderate in, in, uh, in condition, I think we'll continue to see stronger than normal seasonal seasonal prices this fall. There's a lot of feedlot demand for calves as uh, feedlot cost of gain is coming down. There's, uh, there's a lot of heifer demand for retaining heifers. So for all those reasons, I think there'll be plenty of demand relative to supply of, of calves this fall. Okay, are, are, are we seeing a, a, a price difference between the steers and the heifers? You know, cow-calf producers can, you know, obviously anything you have to sell is selling well this right. fall. We don't expect a lot of price decreases. There is an opportunity for some producers to sell heifers a little different than steers mm -hmm. because of that uh, breeding demand, that retention demand, any heifers that are of, of uh, you know quality suitable for replacements, uh, there's opportunities to sell those direct perhaps, uh, sell them by the head in some cases. Uh, in any event, what we're starting to see now in some of the auction reports around the country, if not so much in Oklahoma, is that the heifers are not discounted as much as normal to the steers. And, and you'd expect that because the heifers have two kinds of demand there for breeding and for feeder animals relative to the steers. So, so we're seeing heifers priced closer to the steer values and producers should keep that in mind as they market their calves this fall. Okay, thank you much. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. If you're a regular sunup viewer, you know we focus a lot on soil moisture. Soil moisture is key not only to plant growth, but our weather as well. Drier soils contribute to higher air temperatures and lower humidities. Tuesday afternoon, October 7th, saw air temperatures climb to just under 100 degrees. Grandfield, Walters, and Wauwreka each reached 99 degrees. The coolest locations in the state had a Tuesday high of 84 and humidities in the southwest and Panhandle Tuesday afternoon plummeted into the teens, the dark brown areas. West central Oklahoma had humidities in the 20s. Green areas in the east were above 40 percent. The recent high daytime temperatures have kept four inch soil temperatures in the 70s for much of Oklahoma. A map with three-day averages of bare soil temperature at four inches was mostly yellow, soil temperatures above 70. The green areas show locations with cooler topsoil in the 60s. Why are we so interested in hurricanes in Oklahoma? Because they bring so much moisture inland. Moisture from Hurricane Odile in mid-September came into New Mexico and Texas pushing up the 30-day rainfall total for areas near the small white dots to 20 or more inches of rain. Odeal failed to bring much moisture to Oklahoma. The blue area over western Oklahoma was at a half inch or less. 
A percent of normal rainfall map for the last 30 days emphasizes that shortage of rainfall. The red areas had less than 20% of their normal rain between September 8th and October 7th. Bright orange areas were at 40% or less of normal rainfall. Light orange areas less than 60%, yellow less than 80%. Now moisture from another hurricane, Simon, has come in from the Pacific. On Wednesday, the rainfall forecast map estimated that Oklahoma rainfall totals from Thursday, October 9th to Thursday, October 16th would range from a half inch in the southwest to over four inches in the northeast. We desperately need that rain to get winter canola and wheat crops up and growing. How dry were our soils before this forecasted rain? On Wednesday, the percent of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches for most of western Oklahoma was below 20%, the dark brown areas. Fort Cobb was at 6%, Minco at 8%, and Norman at 7%. The driest location for plant available water was Walters at only 4%. When we look at the plan available water as inches of water from the surface down to 16 inches, Walters had only one-tenth of an inch. The dark brown areas had generally less than a half inch of plan available water. Light brown areas came in above an inch. Yellow areas were between one and a half inches to two inches. The green areas were mostly above three inches. Haskell had the highest plant available water at 4 and 66 hundredths inches. Now we just need to wait and see if all of the forecasted rain becomes measured rain. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Joining us now is Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist. And Kim, we saw a bump in prices this week. Let's start with this bit of good news. Well, we saw wheat prices uh, on the Kansas City uh, December contract go above 580. We got a little over 30 cent cash price increase in wheat. Uh, the uh, corn prices, they went up over that uh, $3.38 uh, resistance level. We got about a 20 cent price increase on the uh, on the corn. Now the problem with the wheat was in the latter part of the week, uh, wheat prices, they dropped back down below that uh, 580 line. They're wallowing around right in that level now. Let's talk about the significance of this 580 price level number. Well, you know, we had a floor at $5.50. That's where we put it uh, several uh, weeks ago, and uh, the, the uh, wheat prices tested it. They came back, back above the uh, 580, and they're wallowing around, right? If we can stay above 580, I think we can get a run up on that July, uh, that December contract on, on the KC contract, maybe up to uh, $6.20, maybe get another 50 cents out of this market. If we stay below that 580, then we're probably gonna, gonna go back down and test 550. And what other factors are you looking in, looking at that are playing into all this? Well, I think, uh, you know, the northern hemisphere, most of the harvest is done. The, the wheat has crossed the scales, uh, the corn, uh, the, the corn crossing the scales is b behind uh, the average. If you look back at the last few years, the corn harvest is, uh, is uh, running slower than expected. I think there's some potential problems with the corn harvest. Plus, in uh, Australia, you've got some drought conditions in a good part of the wheat area. Uh, that's lower in the uh, supply world supply of wheat. The European Union, their, their uh, Gulf uh, loading areas are, are full of uh, wheat that they can't sell because of quality. I think all of that is impacting positive for our wheat prices. And then in terms of U.S. conditions, the harvest here and, and uh, conditions here? In, again, looking at that corn, that the, uh, the corn harvest is behind, uh, the, are behind the schedule and there's some potential problems there. I think also if you look at the hard red winter wheat, the planting conditions, we're a little, uh, we have more planted than we normally do. Uh, the, we've got drought conditions that we're watching there. And for producers who have corn and wheat, what kind of advice do you have for them? I'd sell some wheat and I'd sell some corn on this rally. Anytime you get a 20 cent, 30 cent rally, I'd pull the trigger, not on all of it, but I'd stagger some into the market. Okay, Kim Anderson, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Winter supplement is one of the biggest costs that we face in the cow-calf industry each year. By sorting the cows and putting them into groups that have very, very similar nutrient requirements, we can do the best job of being efficient with our buying and feeding of winter supplements.
There are basically three groups of cows in the herd that I think uh, logically can be sorted together. The first group I'd like to visit about is the one that's the easiest to take care of. That's those cows that are about four years old up to about nine years of age that are in good body condition coming out of summer and going into the fall winter months. That's a set of cows that we can probably supplement with a high protein supplement as long as we've got uh, plenty of standing forage or even grass hay available for those cows to eat. The next group of cows that I would consider are the very, very young cows, the two and the three year olds. Research shows us that these cows on the average are about 20% smaller than the group that was in that, that first set of cows. That means that if they're in the same pen, in the same pasture, trying to compete for the same cubes or the same big round bale of hay, they're probably gonna get shoved aside quite a little bit by bigger boss cows. These young cows actually have a higher requirement in terms of their nutrition because they're continuing to grow. They have to do the same things that those older cows do from a standpoint of keeping in good body condition, producing milk, repairing a reproductive tract after they calve, and they're having to do this at a time when those two-year-olds are going from baby teeth to adult teeth, all of which means it's difficult for them to keep body condition. That's why I think having those two and even three-year-olds separated as, a, as another group that we take really good care of during the course of the winter will help us in the long run. The last group of cows to consider would be the old cows, those that are 10 years of age or older. They're going through their phase of life where they're beginning to lose their permanent teeth and it's more difficult for them to consume the forages that are out on the ground or in the, in the hay bale and they will need some extra supplement, usually a high energy supplement, in order to maintain body condition into calving next spring. So with those three groups of cows, if we can sort them that way, we can feed them separately and be as efficient as possible. Many operations I understand probably don't have three different pastures that they can put the cows into through the course of winter. But if they can just find two, you can then put the young cows and those older cows together and still feed them a higher energy, lower protein supplement in a higher amount and make sure that they're in good body condition going into calving next spring. I think if you'll consider this as you're go going through the, the fall working of these cows and sort them appropriately, that we could be a little more efficient in our winter supplement buying and our winter supplement feeding this year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. As we start winding down the year, it's time to start thinking about the trends for 2015. And joining us now is our extension economist, Demona Doy. And Demona, you and the team are gearing up for the annual Rural Economic Outlook Conference. Right, it's a conference that we bring uh, annually to campus October 31st this year. It'll be in the Alumni Center. It's an opportunity for agribusiness leaders, for ag lenders, for educators, for government officials, and others who want to get a big picture idea of what's in store for the next year. So we'll bring in specialists to talk about a variety of things. And this year there's a, there's a variety of topics and a variety of speakers. Tell us about that. A couple of speakers will address kind of macroeconomic outlook and what it means to the Oklahoma economy. So one of our keynote speakers, Michael Swanson, is with the U.S. largest ag commercial lender, Wells Fargo. He does uh, analysis of markets and outlook as well as looking at the energy sector. And so the title of his talk is something to the effect that it's not just about population and GDP. We hear a lot about the nine billion people we have to have to feed, but uh, there are a lot of interrelated factors that impacts uh, what makes a good decision. And so, for instance, one of his comments is that we're only a handshake away from the China economy. And so are we ready? Are we prepared for that? In addition to Michael, we have uh, some internal speakers. So Green Glacier, in contrast to a call that I had, is not a new EPA uh, uh, regulation that's coming, but it's more talking about how all of the cedars in Oklahoma impact not only agriculture, but also the rural urban interface. We'll talk about water. Gary Fox, our interim director of the Water Center, 
We'll be talking about how the water or lack thereof, uh, opportunities to conserve, to do things differently can help us in our future. And we'll have Jody Campici giving us the latest on Farm Bill, so sorting through all the, the latest alphabet soup and, and giving us some insights into to regulations. And we'll have the usual market outlook panels to give us some grain, livestock, uh, land value, rental rate outside insights. Some familiar faces that we see on Sun Up each week will be a part of that and the ability to go a little more in depth than they have the ability to do on the show. Why is it important to gather people up this time of year and look ahead to 2015 and the year ahead? Well, everybody who wants to be a better decision maker needs to take some time, invest a little bit of time in, in anticipating what's coming down the pike and making sure they're ready for that. And so I think the end of the year is a great time to kind of reassess, step back from our daily activities and try to pick the brains of people who are looking at a lot of different segments of the market and to think about how we might react to that. And you and your colleagues sort of assess what will likely be timely looking forward? Right, and so it's not only about what's going on in the nation and, and even the world, but also some things that are unique to Oklahoma. So for instance, the uh, water issues that have been ongoing because of drought, uh, the eastern red cedar invasion that impacts not only our livestock, but wildfires and wildlife. And you pack a lot into one day. We do. It's a pretty good value. Tell us about registration. Right. For only $50, if you register in advance, you can attend the conference. And so if you send in your money or register online by October 24th, it's $50, $70 at the door. Okay, Damona Doy, Extension Economist, thanks a lot. And if you are interested in registering for the upcoming Rural Economic Outlook Conference, just go to the SUNUP website, sunup.okstate.edu. Now to the business of food. We all have a favorite recipe, but if you want to turn your recipe into a commercial product, that process can be a bit daunting. Luckily, there are people who can help. Sunup's Austin Moore picks up the story from there. Susan brought this in to me and I started sampling this and my sales have just been growing from there. And it's a, it's a nice chunky salsa compared to a lot of others that are a lot thinner. Her, her product is really blowing off the shelf here. That is music to the ears of Ace and the Bull creator, Susan Witt. It's almost like another child. You know, it's your baby. And uh, it really makes me proud when I see it, that, you know, displayed like this. But while Susan created the product, markets it, and in most cases acts as her own distributor, she doesn't produce it. For that, she relies on a co-packer. There's just no way I could do it out of my own kitchen. You know, because when we produce, uh, a batch is at least 15 to 16 cases, which is 12 jars in a case. Co-packers are the only way many small businesses, like Susan's, can get their product to the market. They can't afford to buy equipment, buy a building, hire employees, so it's a way to get started without a major financial investment. and. The way that the co-packers work, uh, they, they work very hard, particularly like Eric here at s, s to make sure that the product you brought them is what you get when they make it. You'll have your recipe, you'll go through that with us. We'll ask lots of questions about how you want your tomatoes diced, your onions diced, those types of things. We'll get it the size and the consistency that you want, make you some test batches, and then we work on the label and the nutritional facts for that, and uh, just keep, keep going forward until we get it where it's ready. Generally that takes anywhere from three to four weeks up to a couple of months to get it completely ready from scratch. So, The co-packer's role is much larger than simply assembling the product, however. They must ensure that safety standards are met for both state law and often stricter retail requirements. They have been to all the training that we have at the Food and Ag Product Center for HACCP food safety, clean in place, about how to sanitize their equipment. So they've been trained as well as anybody in a major food processor would be. Oklahoma State University's Food and Agricultural Products Center provides training for entrepreneurs like Susan Witt as well. 
Basic training is the third Thursday of every even numbered month. We have people from the health food department, the weight measures department, uh, the patent and trademark library to enable them to do their own patent and trademark search for names and so forth. We have business plans, we have legalities and liabilities. We try to give them everything in that one day workshop for them to consider of what's involved in getting started. Believe me, there's a lot of steps. You don't just say, here it is, take it. You know, here's my recipe, take it. There's all the legal things that have to be done, the accounting part that has to be done, just everything, you know, from making sure that your name is okay. So a lot of work, even when working with a co-packer to produce the final product but it is something retailers like Dwight Darrow are hoping to see more of. You know, I, I, I'm looking to find more Oklahoma products that we can sell here. It'd be nice if we, uh, you know, could bring in some additional items for it. And if you'd like to know more about this or other FAPSI programs, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can watch us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and other social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time at SUNUP.